Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me for this bite-sized uh, webinar on the new JSS scheme. It's wonderful to see so many of you attend at 8 a.m. I don't know if that's because the legal profession has a lot of early birds uh, or whether it's because there's been a lot of vigorous head scratching going along. We've had a lot to get to grips with over the last six months. I'm not sure any of us realised that we were to go back uh, and sit a maths exam, uh, but here we are with the JSS scheme. I'm going to do my best to try and break it down uh, and make it as easy to follow as I can uh, in this very short session. Uh, I have produced an Excel spreadsheet which will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you and that will be available uh, after the webinar. Of course, if you've got any questions, you can always drop me a line. So I'm going to look at three things in terms of the JSS scheme, how to make it profitable, uh, some of the pitfalls that our employer clients need to look out for uh, and how it interplays with redundancy and consultation exercise, which I think, in fact, is going to be one of the biggest pitfalls for employers. Uh, I'll briefly touch on the local furlough scheme. We're expecting more details uh, on that this Friday, uh, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. Now, before I get into the numbers, I just want to flag up there is a rounding issue in terms of the maths. The government guidance deals with nice, easy whole numbers, which don't necessarily reflect accurately on the figures because we don't know whether we're rounding up or rounding down. For today's purposes, I'm not going to worry about that too much just to put it on your radar. So let's start with the first section. How do we make the scheme profitable? Well, we first need to understand what the scheme is addressing. Uh, and to do that, we need to look at the difference between what we're referring to as worked hours and lost hours. So take, for example, an employee that normally works 45 hours. The employer decides uh, to reduce their hours down to 15, i.e. a third of what they were working before. Now, the JSS scheme doesn't address the worked hours. The employer is still responsible for paying those as usual. What the JSS scheme does is focus on the lost hours and it sets up a tripartite burden sharing. And that's between the employer, the government and the employee. The employer and the government's contribution come by way of a one third in the form of wage support and the employee's contribution comes in the form of one third wage reduction. Now, this is beautiful for its simplicity, a little unfair to ensure that all three share the burden equally, but that's how the scheme works. Uh, and we'll see in practice how it therefore is easy to calculate at the very least. So if we take that split, so the employee is working 33% of their normal hours, they've lost 67%. And what the scheme then does is takes that lost hours segment and splits it into three. Now you can already see that rounding issue creeping in because you can't split 67 uh, three ways, at least not uh, with whole numbers. Uh, and here, so therefore one side has picked up an extra percent. It may be that you would divide it so it's 22.22 recurring for each of the three of them. Uh, and once you've then set that out, you've, you've split that 67% three ways, uh, you can then piece it back together. And the overall effect, therefore, on the funding for that employee salary is the employer will be paying 55, 56%. That's 33% for the hours the employee is actually working, plus the contribution, the one third contribution, which in this case is 22%, towards the lost hours. The government will then contribute 22%. And so the employer will receive 77, 78% of their overall salary and 22% will then remain unfunded. So that will be uh, what the employer will take by way of a wage reduction. Now, one of the things that I'm being asked is to address this point. 33% is the minimum number of worked hours that an employee must provide. So if they've reduced their hours down to 25%, the job support scheme is not going to be available to them. So if an employee has reduced their hours down to 33%, that means the employer will be paying overall 55, 56% of the salary. 33% productivity does not equal 55%. And so the question from employers is, well, why, why would I do this? If I'm only getting 33%, why ought I to pay 55%? Now, the first thing to address is that 33% is the minimum number of hours that an employee can work and still be entitled to the scheme. It's not the maximum. They can work more. And therefore, 22% is the maximum 
the employer will be required to contribute in terms of the overall salary towards the lost hours. If we have a different scenario where, for example, they're working 50% or 70%, the contribution, although it's still a third of the lost hours, in terms of the overall contribution towards salary, it reduces as those hours increase. So if we look on the left hand side of this chart, the 33%, we can see the big blue box. That's the employer's contribution to the unworked hours, 22.3%. If we go to the other end of the spectrum and we look at, for example, 85%, so the employee's working 85% and has reduced their hours by 15%, the employer's only going to be contributing 5% to that block, a third of the 15%. So you can see 22% is the maximum contribution the employer will make to the unworked hours. But as the worked hours increases, that contribution decreases. Now, that's important. That's an important thing to understand before we get into the profitability analysis, because an employer is going to want to look at this to try and find the sweet spot where they can maximize productivity and minimize the contribution they're being expected to make to a loss of uh, productivity. Ultimately though, however, employers are still gonna be in this situation. We are still funding under productivity, aren't we? Because there will always be a gap in terms of that unworked hours segment that they will have to contribute. The answer to that is yes, but there are two important things that an employer should consider and, and as advisors, we should be encouraging them to consider. The first is, what is the return on investment that you get from your employees? And I'll show some worked examples and, and the importance of that in just a second. And then second, what are the redundancy costs that you're likely to face? Now, of course, employers aren't necessarily going to be picking just between the job support scheme and redundancies. But in real terms, if someone is even contemplating the JSS scheme, those are the two key ticket options they're going to have. And of course, with a redundancy, you not only have the redundancy payments you're going to have to make, you're potentially going to have litigation costs, particularly for large employers. It is inevitable that some of them are likely to challenge uh, these decisions through the employment tribunal. You're also going to have recruitment costs. We're going to come out of this. First of all, we come out of all recessions. But in, in this particular case, it is a very circumstance specific recession, not like, for example, in 2008, that uh, was a recession caused by structural debt problems in the, initially the housing market that then uh, rippled out uh, to the rest of the economy. This is a shutdown because of pandemic, which of course is affecting businesses. Restaurants can't uh, conduct business if they don't have people going to the restaurants because they're staying at home. Once we're out of that crisis, people will obviously start returning to their normal habits. There may well be changes, but ultimately business will resume. And businesses will therefore have to, if they've made redundancies, recruit again to try and bring back uh, the workers that they'll need to service their clients. And of course, for many, that will involve heavy recruitment costs. There's also a possibility of lost productivity. In fact, we saw this in 2008 with aggressive redundancy processes. And when the economy picked up, businesses weren't able to service the demand and therefore had to uh, get together that recruitment process to try and catch up with the process and get back to the productivity that they once had. And of course, bearing in mind, if a vaccine comes out, this, for example, could go away very rapidly, businesses are gonna need that agility. Before I get into the analysis of the profit profitability, I just want to talk about one other issue that I've been, been asked about, and that's the government contribution cap, and therefore whether it really pigeonholes this scheme towards the lower end of the market, i.e. The, uh, the lower salaried employees. The cap works in this way. The overall contribution, regardless of the percentage for the for the government, is capped at six hundred and ninety seven pounds and ninety two pence uh, per month or the equivalent of eight thousand three hundred and seventy five pounds uh, and four pence per annum. Now, if you divide that by twenty two percent, you can then get back to the, the gross salary position, which would be thirty eight thousand and sixty eight pounds. Now, Therefore, the question is, does that equate to a max salary? In other words, does this scheme only assist people that are earning that or less? And the answer to that is a simple no. And the reason for that is the same as the point I made just a moment ago with employers. The max government contribution is 22% if the, um, if the worked hours is 33%. 
But of course, the same with employers applies to the government. If the worked hours is higher, the government contribution is lower. So, for example, if the employee was on 85% worked hours, they would be on 15% unworked hours. The government contribution would then be 5%. If you divide 8,375 by 5%, you get a very substantial salary of 167,000. 500. And so it may well be that this scheme not only will assist the lower work, the, the lower salaried workers, but also potentially at middle and senior management. And so that's worth bearing in mind because it's important when we come on to our profit analysis. Just now going to briefly touch on the spreadsheet tool. I'm not going to actually load the tool up itself because I'm afraid that means switching between the slides. But here's a screenshot of the tool itself. And it's very easy to use. In fact, the only information that you need to input is in those three green boxes uh, over on the left. You insert the employee's normal hours, you insert their adjusted hours, and then you insert their salary as an hourly equivalent. Once you've done that, this, the sheet will then do a number of things. First of all, it'll tell you if the scheme is available, and you can see that just on the right-hand side next to the green boxes. That will turn red and tell you it's unavailable if you've not put in uh, enough minimum hours. It will then break down the salary in terms of the normal salary and the lost hours and the government cap. And then in the bigger section at the bottom, it tells you the contribution rates. So first of all, it tells you what the employer's contribution is towards the worked hours, the contribution towards the lost hours, and then the total contribution they're going to be making to the employee's salary or the total payment. In the next row, you then have the government contribution. They won't be contributing anything to the worked hours. And then it will set out what they will contribute to the lost hours. And then, of course, you aggregate that at the, the end and you get the total adjusted salary. So whereas this particular employee was previously earning £675 per week, they're now going to be earning £525, £370 from their employer and £150 from the government contribution, albeit the employer will pay it to the claimant, uh, to, the, to the employee, uh, and then recover that as a grant. I'm now going to look at some worked examples and in particular look at the profitability question. So let's take our company Blue Limited. They provide services to business clients. They have six employees in scope for this particular analysis. As a result of COVID, they now only require three. Each of the employees is paid £2,400 per calendar month and the business has additional costs which equate to roughly £600 per employee. Now, that will be an overall cost of £3,600. Some of that will be fixed costs, i.e., for example, rent or licenses for software, etc., that they won't be able to change or scale. Others might be variable costs, for example, NIC contributions, etc. Now, a proper analysis will break that down between the fixed costs that will remain regardless of what you do with employees and the variable costs that might change. However, for today's purposes, I'm just going to keep it nice and simple and just have those additional costs. The Business Blue Limited charge its clients £6,000 for per employee. And that therefore leaves them with a profit of £3,000 per employee. The £6,000 less the wage cost of £2,400 less the other costs of £600 equivalent per employee. So that gives you the return on investment in an ordinary circumstance. Of course, Blue Limited now need to reduce by a headcount of three, but they first consider rather than reducing headcount, let's reduce hours and see whether the JSS will assist us. Now, there's a particular advantage to employers in the sense that they're not going to be paying the full salary. Employers will take a pay cut, but ultimately they at least have the security of knowing that they still keep their job rather than potentially going out into the market in these uncertain times. So it gives the employee, although taking a pay cut job security for a period of time, and the employer then potentially still has the opportunity of making a profit. So let's look at how the JSS scheme would work for Blue Limited in this scenario. They retain all six employees, but they reduce them down to 50%, leading to their three full-time equivalent. Of course, each of them will receive £1,200 for their worked hours, half of their previous salary, but they now have a loss of £1,200 for the other 50%. That is split three ways. The employer pays £400, the government, of course, would pay £400 uh, and the employee would take a £400 pay cut. But the cost to Blue Limited is going to be £1,600 in total. The £1,200 for the worked hours and the £400 contribution uh, towards the unworked hours. 
Now, their total expenditure, therefore, is going to be £13,200. 1,600 times six for the wages equals £9,600. And then their additional costs of, of £600 per employee equivalent multiplied by six, that's 3,600. If you total those two together, you get your 13,200. The total income for this particular business now is gonna be 3,000 pounds per employee because they're working 50% of the time, therefore their productivity is half, but you still have six employees doing that work. Six times 3,000, you have 18,000. 18,000 income less your expenditure leaves you with a profit of 4,800 pounds. So the first thing to understand is that Blue Limited can use this scheme, retain its employees and still turn a profit. But of course, any business is going to want to look at whether or not it is more profitable or less profitable than the alternative. So let's look at the alternative. Instead of reducing their hours down to 50 percent, they decide to reduce their headcount by 50 percent. Well, in those uh, in that situation, you're going to still have three employees earning £2,400. So three times 2400 is 7200 They're still going to have their costs of 3600 although the equivalent is £600 per employee, because it will involve fixed costs, it doesn't mean because you've lost three employees, those costs will reduce. As I mentioned, of course, if you were doing a detailed analysis, you'd want to separate that out between your fixed and variable costs. Keeping things simple today, we just stick with the 3,600 costs, assuming they're all fixed. That gives us a total expenditure of 10,800 pounds. Now, the total income is gonna remain the same, but for different reasons. So you're getting three employees with maximum contribution, so you can still charge your clients 6,000 pounds, but you've only got three employees, so it's now 6,000 times three. That gives you the same figure, 18,000. Your total profit now is 7,000, 200, 18,000 less your 10,800. If we do a straight comparison, whilst we can see the job support scheme is profitable, redundancies in this situation is going to be more profitable. And the difference between the two options is 2,400 pounds per month. So yes, JSS is a profitable option, but redundancies is a more profitable option, more profitable by 2,400 pounds per calendar month. However, the business then has to take into account all of the other costs, the costs of redundancies, the costs of litigation, and of course, then those other costs, loss of profit when things uh, begin to pick up and they can't service the demand straight away, the cost of recruitment. More importantly, one of the key advantages of the JSS scheme is the adaptability and scalability of it. If an employer gets rid of three of its employees and is left with six employees, but then there's an immediate upturn or there's a temporary upturn, those six employees can't work more than full time. I mean, obviously, they can work a few more hours, but there is a ceiling on the amount of work you can get out of those six employees. Whereas if you had retained six employees on 50 percent, you can scale them up if you need to. So there is a degree of agility in the JSS model than there would be over the redundancy model. Of course, it is not a one option or the other. It may well be the employer says, look, actually what I'm going to do is make two people redundant, retain four and reduce their hours and then use the job support scheme for the four remaining employees and employers can mix and match to suit their needs. The key takeaway point here is that, first of all, the job support scheme can still allow the employer to turn a profit. And second of all, it may well be that when you take into account everything, it is a more profitable option than redundancies. What is important is that an employer conducts this analysis so they know the true position. Now I'm just going to touch on a few of the pitfalls. The first is to flag up that the JSS scheme has a financial assessment test for large employers. Now, how that test will work in practice, we're going to wait further details, but in essence, it's going to be looking at their turnover to see whether or not it is lower than it would have been pre-COVID, how much lower, whether it just needs to be lower or whether it needs to be lower by a particular margin we've yet to see. That uh, financial assessment test does not apply to SMEs. 
an employee must be on an employer's payroll by the 23rd of September. Obviously, that date is now passed. Note the use of the indefinite rather than the definite article. That suggests that if an employee was on an employer's payroll by that date, but then moves to a different employer, they're still going to be able uh, and eligible for the scheme. Another key pitfall for employers to understand is that the scheme does not class one national insurance contributions and pension contributions. Employers are still going to be expected to pick up that tab, which of course is something that needs to be factored in when doing the profit analysis. There's also an expectation set out in the guidance that employers cannot top up. In other words, they can't say to the employer, look, under this scheme, you're working 33% out. Therefore, you would be expected to take a 22% pay cut, but we'll top that up for you. Now, to some extent, that seems counterintuitive. Why would the government not want employers to be gratuitous and support their employees um, more than the scheme requires? Uh, there is no there's no exact answer to that, but my anticipation is that the government might give us some further information. They might not. But in reality, I suspect it has a lot to do with fraud prevention. We know there has been a lot of fraudulent use of the CJRS scheme, and this may be one device that the government has opted for to try and reduce that. If the employer could top up, then it may well be that an unscrupulous employer could say to an employer, look, work 100 percent of your hours. We'll tell the government that you're working 50 percent and we'll we'll get a bit of a top up. Of course, if the employer is required to take a pay cut, they're less likely to uh, comply with any such device or scheme. That's just a theory of mine. I don't know if it's the accurate explanation. Uh, otherwise, it seems counterintuitive. Uh, and the last and particularly vital point is that an employer must agree this in writing. And that agreement has to be available for inspection by HMRC. So how does the job support scheme interplay with redundancy and consultation process, which, as I said at the beginning, I think is perhaps one of the biggest pitfalls. First thing to understand is the scheme is available from the beginning of November to the end of April 21 next year. Initially, for the first three months, the minimum worked hours is 33 percent, as I've set out. The government have indicated that will be reviewed and it might be that employees are going to be expected to work a higher proportion of their normal hours after that three month window. But obviously we'll have to wait and see. A particularly important point for employers to get to grips with both if they're in the JSS scheme and before they embark upon it is that they will not be allowed to make somebody redundant or put them on notice of redundancy while they are claiming the JSS. Now, the, the memo, and I, it is more of a memo than guidance, refers to putting them on notice rather than putting them at risk of redundancy. Whether that's an unfortunate use of terminology and we'll get some further clarification, we've yet to see. But on its face, it wouldn't stop an employer from starting the consultation process. They just couldn't trigger the notice provision. Now, Here's the crux of what I think is the interplay between the JSS and that's uh, the, the consultation process. Employees can, and my advice recommendation should, use the JSS as a consultation point. Have you considered using the JSS scheme as an alternative to making us redundant? I would be willing to take a pay cut and reduce my hours. Joe Bloggs, he is also willing. I've had a chat with him. Tina Smith, she's also willing. Three of us are willing to look at this and engage with you. Have you considered it? Now, that potentially throws a spanner in the works for consultation if employers haven't considered it, because, of course, if they then don't take that point on board, there's arguments about whether there's been proper consultation. But in my view, employers should have a JSS analysis if they are consulting with employees, because if they don't, they are exposing themselves to any unfair dismissal claims. Think about that for a moment. First of all, the employee may well raise this themselves. They may well say, look, there, this was a point I raised and the employer didn't properly consider it. It may be that the employee says, I wasn't properly consulted. The consultation was a sham. I wasn't really given a proper opportunity. Yes, we had these meetings, but they, you know, it was just the employer talking at me. Now, we see those sorts of arguments all the time. They're not novel. But one of the advantages employers have is that when we get to tribunal, there's obviously a big passage of time, typically a sort of year between dismissal uh, and the tribunal hearing date. Obviously, now it's even longer. Uh, and one can say, OK, you're running the argument that we didn't consult with you. But today you still haven't said what you might have advanced to save 
your job to avoid the redundancy. And the reason being is because there weren't any proposals. This was the realistic alternative. And because of that, redundancies are the only option that we had to pursue. And that's why you haven't thought of anything, particularly now you've had the benefit, if you have, of legal advice. And the reality is that's because a lot of this is business centric decisions and tribunals don't really get involved in that. As long as there's been an earnest consultation, it ultimately is down to the employer at what route they take to protect their business. But of course, an employee now, even if they don't raise it at the time, will have the benefit of with a lawyer saying, well, the JSS, that was something that you could have considered. Now, an employer may well say, well, it wouldn't have helped. But if they haven't done an analysis, bearing in mind this is a simple mathematical exercise, the tribunal is likely to say, well, how did you know? And without that analysis, employers, in my view, are going to find it very difficult to defend the consultation process, whether it is adequate and whether or not the employee was properly consulted and whether the business genuinely considered alternatives. Now, there will be scenarios, for example, a total secession of work where the employee wouldn't even be eligible because there was no work available for them to meet the 33% minimum threshold, or as that increases, if it does that, whatever that increases to, this won't then be an issue. But if you're looking at a headcount reduction, like in the BR Limited example I gave earlier, this is something that would be actively engaged and businesses, in my view, therefore, without that JSS analysis, are gonna struggle if employment tribunals then have to look at the redundancy process as I suspect they're going to be doing for quite some time. I'm now very briefly going to touch on the local furlough scheme, uh, which is our next instalment. We've only just got to grips with the JSS scheme. Some people have called it JSS expansion, whatever you might want to call it. We're already on to the next instalment. We're going to get full details of that on Friday. Ultimately, it appears that it's going to cover businesses that are forced to close due to COVID. You may well have seen the announcement yesterday. In fact, we've had sort of precursor uh, in the news leading up to the announcement yesterday that we're now going to have this sort of three tier system that will designate local areas and, and what uh, can happen in those local areas. Uh, Liverpool already in the high risk area. One anticipates that they won't be alone uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, and so this scheme is designed to assist businesses that are forced to lock down uh, and it could cover up to 80 percent. What I would suggest is wait for the announcement, get the further details, but look for the small print. I don't think it's a coincidence this has been referred to local furlough when the government hasn't yet ruled out a national lockdown. And of course, I don't think the government is going to want to or be in a position to go back to the full extent of the CJRS scheme where national lockdown, they'll go back to a full furlough. I may be wrong. I may be being a little cynical, uh, but that's the terminology they've used and they are avoiding any confirmation uh, about national lockdown and whether that may or may not happen. The key point is, just as with the, the JSS scheme, we need to consider how this might interplay with the consultation and redundancy processes uh, and whether or not an employer needs to conduct an analysis of these new schemes. I suspect it's going to play less of a role because if a business is forced to close down, well, then you're unlikely to have employees that are going to be able to work the minimum required uh, but of course wait and see uh, uh, for the for the old scheme and it may well be that therefore redundancies are um, something that the employer just simply has to consider because they can't uh, take into account any option to contribute if they're not making any profit. I, I hope that's been helpful uh, obviously I know it may well generate questions please feel free either uh, to drop me a line in the chat window or, or indeed my email address is up there you can either send me an email or, or pick up the phone I'm more than happy uh, to answer questions as they uh, arise I'm going to post the uh, spreadsheet onto my LinkedIn profile later this afternoon if you're not connected with me by all means uh, send me an invite I'm happy to uh, pick that up and, and you'll have access to uh, my spreadsheet there it will then go up also onto the Guildhall website uh, next week probably so if you don't get it one way you'll hopefully get it uh, the other and also the slides and the video will also be available uh, i hope that's been very helpful thank you for joining me at such an early hour i hope you can go and have some coffee and enjoy the rest of your day take care